I'll get this uh, inside shot right here. Excuse, yeah. excuse the ashy knees. Ashy knees. Two fingers, lay on your back and relax. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's Canadian. <laughs> I'm happy. So, this is a Delphi personalized tourniquet system for blood flow restriction. Okay, FDA medical approved device, right? So what it has and what we're gonna do different on on you than, than what you might have seen or heard before is a Doppler built into it. So it's gonna measure your blood flow going into your limb and it's gonna do what's called an LLP, a limb occlusion pressure measurement to see how much pressure it takes to make all of your blood flow stop. Because everyone's pressure is different. Okay. Based on systolic blood pressure, the size of your limb, how much adipose tissue versus muscle you have. So probably more adipose than muscle for you. Yeah. Um, a little bit of a wider cuff changes it, the placement of the cuff is it's all ashy different. Knees. Ashy knees, yeah. I don't, we haven't done that study yet, but ashy knees could come into play. What's Wearing a beanie on your head, I don't know what that does to you no, as well. Yeah. But the Doppler is real sensitive. It measures the uh, sinusoidal arterial wave flow. So when you do it, you gotta be real quiet. This is like the hardest part for patients, especially at our place, is making these turkeys shut up or not be on their phone for like, 30 seconds to do the Doppler. All right, you ready? Mm -hmm. It's just going to be tight. Oops. And we got to charge it. <laughs> Trying to be still and quiet, remember? You're as bad as my patients, man. So the bigger your leg, the longer the Doppler takes. So you got a pretty big quad. We have a 44 inch cuff, which is like this freaking big for our NFL lineman. It's giant. So 209 millimeters of mercury was how much pressure it took to make all your blood flow stop. That's the term for that's LOP. 80% of that's kind of what we target for the lower extremity and 80% of that would be 167. So we're gonna allow 20% arterial flow to go in, but we're gonna block pretty much all of venous return while you do it, okay? So, I'll let it flake. We're gonna do, you wanna do squat? Let's do it. Let's do it, all right, jump up, man. Ooh. So we're just gonna use the standard protocol, um, our, our basic kind of strength and hypertrophy protocol. You're gonna do a set of 30, okay? Ooh. Yeah, come on, it's just body weight. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I judge my spot for him. You, you gotta get warmed up first, right? Yeah. And so the, the system monitors it, and it's always gonna try and maintain that 80% limb occlusion pressure, because as your muscle moves, pressure changes. As the venous return gets blocked, the leg's going to swell and it's going to change what it would be. So it's trying to always maintain that number for you. Don't lose count, Jared. Nope. Three, nice and easy. So this first set, this is kind of our ringing out, okay. the, the Krebs cycle. So your body's still using slow twitch right now because you still have oxygen on board and, and now we're just kind of deoxygenating as much of the muscle as we can. This first set's kind of an easy one. That's why it's a high volume set and it's to, to choke out Krebs. So most people are like, ah, this is not that hard. People told me this was gonna be hard. Yeah, I can feel the Krebs leaving the quads. Yeah, <laughs> all right. And so then, typically what would happen is you would maybe start doing this and slowly almost get in a little bit anaerobic, but then you rest, you perfuse with oxygen again, you get right back into Krebs. Did you get 30? Do we need a counter? So we got a... Exercise counter. I believe this is 30. Okay, plus or minus. Whew. Now it's a 30 second rest, and you can look at the timer on here. So you would go at, at five, uh, at about 540. And during this rest period, now we're still blocking. Okay. So now your body is still thinking it's under a little bit of, of stress, yeah. right? Because it's not allowing oxygen in there. And so your body doesn't know if you're doing squats for 500, yeah. if you've got a crazy tourniquet on your leg, or you're running from a dinosaur to save your life. And now you go, and now you're going to start getting into more of these fast switch fibers, right? Yeah. All right. How many? 15. So this is a three set of 15. This is where the real magic happens. So we're in fast switch, Bill. These big, wide medical grade tourniquets, they pretty much are going to make sure none of that lactate leaves. So now you're going to start building up metabolites within the muscle. Lactate starts to build up. Now your pituitary gland is starting to get tickled from your type three and four afferents. So What's you, tickled, all right? We're under stress. Whew. Okay. Now you do another 30 second rest. So you're gonna go at 435. Definitely feels exactly like 
a strenuous workout. Arm squats. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Man. Which is beautiful. <laughs> if you were post-op ACL, you're doing this, you're not putting any stress, right? Yeah. So it's it's like you're you're putting heavy load, but we're not worrying about any stress, you know, for articular lesion, for meniscus repair, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not stressing this because it was so cool. <laughs> Five more seconds and you do another fifteen. Another fifteen. Whew. The hat might come off in a minute. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> it's easing its way off. Alright, go for it. And, you know, Jared is no stranger to working out. He's had plenty of weight on his back before, so it's very, you know, it's true. If he's, it's very interesting to see him breathing like this and working like this. And this is just body weight. So typically someone that's not injured, if we're getting later phases of rehab um, where they're getting beyond their injury, we would be loading. So you'd be more at a 20 to 30% load. That's a beast. This is early phase rehab right here. No, no load at all other than body weight. That's crazy. <laughs> and then look at, pull your legs up, and you'll start to see one side is definitely will start to swell. Even the VMO, we see swelling. And so yeah. what we're starting to see, and how much tighter it gets, is that swelling effect makes the myocyte start to swell. And when the myocyte swells, that turns on protein synthesis. So just even potentially causing that swelling in, the, in somewhere like the VMO, we're making the myocyte within those muscle fibers turn on protein synthesis to make that muscle put on some Take that myocytes. Yeah. All right, go for it. Last 15. Last 15. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go for my BFR max. Did you work out this morning? I did you CrossFit this morning. So the, the machine is, is constantly changing the, the, pre the pressure. Yeah, so that Doppler reading is locked it in there and it's a, a tourniquet system should monitor itself and make sure the pressure it's putting out is the pressure that it is truly putting out. We have a study going on in the UK where they're looking at the different pressures some of these other kind of non-medical devices put out, the pressures are through the roof, they're all over the place, which can cause a pressure gradient, which can cause what, what people fear with tourniquets is nerve damage. You talk to the tourniquet researchers. So that's why we got to be careful. Done? Yeah. Go good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we just deflate. And no risk of nerve. Earned your deflate. Yeah, there. Well, earned my deflate. Earned your deflate. Uh, the biggest uh, way that we can mitigate risk would be to to know what your pressure is because everyone's different. Mm -hmm. So if you were a young, you know, 15 year old high school uh, female soccer player, it's going to take much less pressure. So we don't want to guess because I don't want to fill her with a ton of pressure mm -hmm. um, and potentially demyelinate, squeeze the fat off the nerve. We know your pressure, so we're down below what a full occlusion would be. We use a wide tapered cuff, which makes it where we have to use, we use much less pressure. So a wider and more tapered cuff, you have much less pressure. A thin, smaller cuff, it takes much more pressure to get an effect. And so the higher the pressure, the bigger the pressure gradient. So again, that's why in ORs, they're not using thin little straps or wraps or whatever, because yeah. there's potential damage that could happen with that. So yeah, we mitigated as much of any nerve injury risk there could be. Okay. We followed all the rules that the FDA puts out. Yeah, I felt I feel better than some squad days. Some oh. squad days doing this. You know, this yeah. was it's just local, super localized. Mm -hmm. Duh, because it's turning good, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, it feels great. Well, then think about you know someone after even like a back surgery who can't put a load on their back. Yeah, some high end football player, right? Yeah, um, this is be. this is something that we can do on the legs and, and maintain that without risking any load on a post-surgical back or someone with an injured back or something like that. Yeah. And then we're really interested in what is the downstream effects of this. So what does, you, you dropped it off from there, take it off. I'm what does, all, all that lactate buildup, that stimulates endogenous growth hormone release. What does that do for healing since we, we, we have a pretty good idea that growth hormone helps with collagen synthesis. Collagen synthesis happens in bone, it happens in tendon, it happens in joint. So now can therapists manipulate endogenous growth hormone releases for their patients to, to improve healing or recovery? Um, again, what does this increased stem cell load that we see happen from this do for people that are trying to recover? So it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating, all these other effects that we can see from it as well. Crazy, huh? Great, right, a little winded. Yeah. yeah. And still, you know, you still, it feels like, it feels like a heavy squat day. It feels like a heavy leg day. And what's really cool, and this is where we talk, and, you know, we have so many teams now that do it from a performance standpoint, right? If you go through a season, a competitive season, 
you're just breaking down muscle throughout the season. Yeah. Right? Yeah. These guys are just breaking down. I mean, as the as the season goes on, they're getting more and more injuries. Now, how do you turn on and put on more muscle or, or try and mitigate that? You want to turn on protein synthesis. Well, how would you do that traditionally? Well, they would go lift heavy. These guys probably don't want to go like start lifting heavy and be sore. Yeah. And then, oh, man, we got to plan this. We've got a game. Yeah. Especially these road teams, you know, MLB, NBA, NHL, where they're traveling all the time. They're using like hotel gyms. Um, so this is a way throughout the season because within a few hours, you're going to feel perfectly fine. Because there wasn't, there was no mechanism for muscle damage. Right. There's not enough load. So if there's no muscle damage, but only the upside effects from a performance side of the house, that's, that becomes very interesting. And then we're doing it a ton with the strength and conditioning coaches with these pro teams and college teams. So I can get all the hashtag gains I want without the muscle damage. Right. And, and, and that's, you know, and there's different ways, you know, a periodization scheme is something you want to do. Because, well, you know, people are like, well, you just do BFR all the time. Well, no, because there are good things that come from lifting heavy. Right. Mm -hmm. The bone needs a load. The tendon needs a load. The you know the the, the central kind of stimulus of yeah. lifting heavy. But yeah, this is a great way to periodize it for our pros and college folks throughout the season. And I have no, I yeah, it, this this area does not know that it was this beautiful machine with Canadian beats versus <laughs> a heavy squat. Right. So right, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, Johnny Owens. Yeah, yeah, Johnny Owens. Uh, can somebody get certified in this? You can. We, we have courses, um, so it's, it's out into the general public now. I think our last count, we had like 625 certified providers throughout the country. Um, healthcare systems are certified, so the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, um, uh, Memorial Hermann Houston, Methods Houston, et cetera, and, and, and individual clinics are really jumping on it now. So on our website, we have certification uh, dates. We have quite a few lined up throughout the country, recoveryscience.com. Students can get certified. Um, it's at a discount. You get $200 off. This is a medical device, so you have to have a medical license. And that, that's what's very kind of cool and interesting about this. So Joe Blow off the street can't do it. Patient can't just get it. It has to be someone with a medical license. So MD, PT, OT, ATC, Cairo. If you have a medical license, you can get certified with it. A student can get certified, but they can't actually purchase it or, or start using it until they get their license. So then once they get their license, they send it in. And we've had quite a few students come and they'll send in their license. And you know, we had one of the trainers from a team who went and interviewed and got a new job with the team and so one of the questions in the interview they asked him was he blood flow restriction Ooh. certified yet and they knew he came in they were able to purchase a bunch of units and they're on workers comp with the pros so they can as soon as they get a certified person they can start getting them 